Hey everybody, there are moments that I have conversations with people that I feel them even before they come into the room. I'm not quite sure how that happens. I don't think I need to know how it happens. But what's really interesting is in the mosaic, the book over my left shoulder, one of the underlying principles of the book is that nothing is as it seems. And we think we're pretty much these solid bodies and we think we're pretty much these forms and we pretty much think we're limited by the environment that we're in or the things that happen around us. And more and more as I open up to this world around me and I receive people into this beautiful, beautiful room, more and more what I'm realizing is that none of that's true that we are connected in an energetic way so deeply with people that we don't even know. And that's what happened today. I really have no idea who the woman is that's sitting in front of me. I, I, we, we connected on LinkedIn. We felt an instant connection. The work that she seems to be doing is similar to the work that I'm doing. But because I, I wanted to have her on the show, I didn't, I didn't go through it too much because the whole idea of this show is to have strangers come into a room that don't know that much about each other. So I wanted to not know too much about her. But I can guarantee you something. I, I do want to know a lot more about her from just the feeling, the energy, the even as we sat here and talked, the kindness of spirit, the beauty of her soul. I definitely want to know more about her and I want you to know more about her too. Um, I have to take a moment to say thank you to our sponsor, which is the Mosaic. The Mosaic is all about what I just talked about. And it's beautiful. It's the book that I wrote. It's the story about a boy who loses his parents and the, and the launch off point for him was losing his parents on the same day, two years apart. And as a boy, he just wondered, why in the world does that happen to a boy where that he loses? The, the, his dad was his, his idol. He looked up to him more than anything in the world. And in a moment, he was gone. And he wondered why in the world that happens. And, and he asked the adults, where are, my, where are my parents? And they said, they're in a place called heaven. Don't worry. And the boy wanted to find where that place called heaven was because he didn't know what it was. He didn't know how to find it. So he just set up and on a journey and started to talk with people and, and listen to people. But the people he met along the way didn't seem like the people that can answer that question. They weren't the clergy and the swamis and the gurus and the, and the holy men and women and, or the aborigines elders. Rather, they were the trash man and the blind woman, the homeless guy and the juice man. <laughs> and he wondered why, why these people, of all the people that I can meet, of the 8 billion people that are in this world, why am I meeting these people? And then he thought, let me just sit with them and, and listen to them. Maybe, maybe it's, they'll reveal something in the stories that they tell me. So he sat with each one of them and listened to them. In 100% of the cases, the person he ended up walking away from was not at all the person he ended up coming to. Who they were was so much different than what he thought they were when he first saw them. And we all know you can't judge a book by its cover and first impressions are rarely right. But it's amazing how much in the world we live in, we judge people by the first impressions we make, be it the color of their skin, be it their, their economics, be it what country they come from. All of that, and none of it is real. None of it means anything because the person inside that person is so connected to us. And that's what's happening to me in these conversations. I've already spoken now with people from every continent on the planet. And it's beautiful to see. And it's really changing me because anytime I come in with a preconceived notion of what's going on, never is, true, never is what's going on. So as you know me, if you've listened to the show, this is meant to be a, a dialogue, not a monologue. And it's starting to sound a lot like a monologue. So thank you, sponsor of The Mosaic. If you like the story, my sponsor hopes you'll purchase the book through Amazon or online through, through my uh, website. But we can let go of that now and we thank you. And there's something far more beautiful happening right here. In front of me right now in this magical place called the Zoom Room is Hema Vyas. Hema, how are you and welcome to the conversation. Oh, hi, Daniel. It's such a pleasure to be here. I'm doing really well. Thank you. I, I love that. And, I, and, and thank you for, for, it's a pleasure to have you. 
I, I'm gonna circle around if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna ask that question one more time. Not, and I wanna put it into the context of the world that I see. Because so often, how are you has become a salutation rather than a, a real question. And often I think it's because people who are hearing the question don't really feel the other people are interested in hearing the answer. I am interested in hearing the answer. Mm -hmm. We've got a global pandemic going on. We're isolated and, and quarantined. Um, for me, just to be really personal, I have a developmentally delayed daughter who lives in a group home and I haven't been able to see her for almost seven months. Tomorrow's her birthday and I'm picking her up today to have her with me for eight days. And I can't tell you how excited I am because all I've seen her in is Zoom calls like this and I'm gonna to get to hold her and hug her and be with her and walk with her and you know, be together. And, and that simple thing, I didn't real, I, I mean, I realized how much I missed her, but I didn't realize how empty that leaves me to not be able to be with my daughter. We have race riots going on. We have Me Too movements going on. We have institutions that we thought we could believe in. We're finding we can't believe in them anymore. How are you, again, now within that context? How, is, how are you working your way through all this? Um, so, you know, that's a beautiful question. And the truthful answer is that, you know, there is a silent despair. And um, with everything that's going on, you know, not being able to see people, not being able to connect with them, not being able to touch them. But as you said, you know, the, the biggest thing for me is being, you know, how do we decipher the truth? There is so much, you know, kind of polarization and diversity and people, you know, one extreme to the other. And for me, it's been a real challenge to really, really tune in more than ever before. You know, I've always been somebody who talks about the power of the heart, the power of truth and the need for truth on this planet for us to be authentic, to be truthful about who we are, where we're going, what we want. And now at the moment, it's really been a challenge to really go in and find what is my truth with all these polarizations, you know, with all the different ideas, different people, fake news, as you say, the, the institutions we put our trust in and we realize that we really can't. So what needs to happen? So I, I've gone on to a big sort of journey, a bit of a dark night of the soul, and I feel I'm coming out. There's a light at the end of the tunnel where we, I feel like it's, for me personally, it's really important that I bring about a message of hope and a message of change, a real need for a shift in our perspective and about how we live in the world. And it starts with leadership. But it also, you know, leaders are, you know, the trash men. Leaders are, you know, anybody who is touching the lives of other people. And in one way or another, whether we realize it or not, everybody is touching everybody else's life. Yeah. So what you're doing is, is beautiful. And I'm so proud to be here and honored to be part of this. So thank you. I, I thank you so much for your kind words and for... And I want to just invite the listener in to just, so I know Emma about all of 10 minutes. I met her a little bit in the green room. We haven't had much time to talk. We, she, she agreed to come onto the show, which was, uh, which I, and look at the intimacy in which she speaks. Look at the, look at the vulnerability in which she speaks. And look what's possible. If you simply hold the space for another human being and tell them that whatever they do, you will love and accept them. You will listen to them and hear them and you'll acknowledge and validate their truth is their truth. And you don't, you won't fight with them. It, it isn't some special gift I have. It's a special gift we all have. We just all have to decide that that's what we want to do. And I want to just thank you, Hannah, for just showing up so incredibly beautifully and sharing that. For those people who aren't familiar with Dark Knight of the Soul, which, you know, I, I can't imagine there are many, but for those people who don't know what the feeling is from inside, what's that feel like? Um, it's, it's sort of where you're in the midst of darkness, where you can't see or believe that there is a way out because it feels 
so overwhelming and it feels so much bigger than you whatever's going on externally and internally feels bigger than than you or the resources that you have in that moment and so really it is a journey where we have to work through whatever it is that is keeping us in that density and to imagine and create another way out and so it's a space and place where um, you wake up and you question who you are you question why you're here you question what your purpose is you question if there is a point to this you question if there is something bigger than you is there something else out there that is bigger and more meaningful and when you start questioning if there's meaning in life you know I think you lose a little bit of your spirit and a little bit of that joy. And so it's a, it's a place where it's joyless and there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of grief, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of anguish. But I also think that it is a place where, of potentiality, you know, like it is a place where you are asked from the universe to, to really step up and, and dig deeper because deep within us, in our hearts, as you say, we all have this within us. We have that space and place that knows that there is meaning. Um, but the density, the darkness is just there to help us grow that little bit more. Yes. And perhaps it's a, it's a bigger shift than previously. Yeah. Talk to me about the courage that it takes to walk into that space because so many people come up against that wall and just turn their back on it and turn around. And talk to me about the courage it takes to look at the pain, to question who we are, to talk about you know this fact, especially for a person like you. From what I understand, your whole mission is to talk about lo love and how trust your heart and how your heart will guide you. And in a moment like this, it almost seems hard to do that. And I can understand why this dark night of the soul would come upon you, because how do you open up your heart to a world that is just screaming and yelling and seems to want to do cause pain to each other? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I think that the courage is um, when you see so many other people are lost and they're beyond lost. You see so many people who are struggling but can't even own that they're struggling. And that's when you realize that, you know, somebody has to make that choice. Because as I say, we are all leaders in our own lives. And I think it requires that sort of courage to become the leader in your own life and say, you know, who do I choose to be? And who I choose to be is to walk my walk and to talk my talk. And if I want to help other people through this, then I have to recognize that what I'm going through is my journey to understand on a deeper level so that I can help those who are struggling even, you know, on a deeper level than I am and help them to get to that place. And it's not an easy journey because, you know, when you're at a place in your life where you are that person, the, the sort of light for other people and you're guiding other people through their darkness, when you are in, caught up in the darkness, you have to find that light within yourself. And that's been a, a real journey for me. Yeah, I, I bet. Again, thank you for the honesty and I wanna bring the listener in as well. Where are you at in this whole issue? Where, where are you in looking at the darkness within yourself? What is this pandemic? What of the race riots and, and race civil rights movements? What is the Me Too movement brought out in you that you haven't wanted to look at in yourself? I know I am the quintessential white man. Okay, so I am the one, I mean, certainly not in me, but this persona is what everybody wants to be. Everybody wants to be the white man because the white man seems to have all the power. But I can't tell you how ashamed I am of the white man because in every single place where the white man has entered, he's brought chaos and confusion and, and suffering to the people that he's, that, that are, he's walked into their lands to, to inhabit. And I thought I was pretty clean in all of it. But I took a Harvard standardized test on race 
and on color. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked to find that the, the results of the tests were, I'm much more comfortable with white skinned people than dark skinned people. And if you would have asked me, um, are you a racist? I would have said, I'm the least racist possible person in the world. I love people. In fact, I was pissed at God when I was created because I looked at my skin and I thought I was supposed to be a black man when I came out. And, and I remember that. I remember looking and saying, what happened? What did you do to me? Right? So you would think someone entering in with that thought would feel like these are my brothers, these are my sisters, that it doesn't matter what color. Everything I speak about is not around color but we have so many built-in associations that white is good and black is bad. Um, the cowboys wore black hats who were the bad guys in, our, in all our Westerns. You know, the good guys wore the white hats. Um, we call enlightenment. We have to come out of the dark night of the soul. All, all those words are connotations that mentally say dark is not a good place, light is a good place. So one of the things that I'm playing with here, and I'd love your input on it, is what if there is no good place and bad place? What if dark is actually a beautiful place? Not necessarily to build a home in and to live there the rest of your life. But the journey of darkness is so important for us to actually purge ourselves of what we have that we're not proud of. In, in the mosaic, I call that character the beast. Yes. The beast is our passion. The beast is our fire. Yes. The beast is also the one that makes us incredibly embarrassed and outrages us because he does things that, that, we want, that we in our civilized way wouldn't do. But he does it because he's just full of that passion and wants to live his life. And what Mo does in the story is he takes him downstairs and he locks him up in a room and he padlocks it with 17 padlocks so that he's stuck in that room. Mm -hmm. Well, one day the beast gets out of that room and runs rampant through the town. Mm -hmm. And Mo, ha it, Mo has to deal with how do I embrace the beast and bring him back into my reality. Do you find in the work that you do that people are disassociated from their beast? Yes, absolutely. And I, I think that, you know, if we accepted that there was beauty in both the dark and the light, and we're evolving, so we never stay in one place, you know? Um, and I think that that's a beautiful message to give to the world, because this idea that we should all be happy and optimistic and cover up anything that is dark or painful or we shouldn't go there with those thoughts or those feelings or we certainly shouldn't own them when somebody says how are you is what's made us get to the point where we're at with our with humanity yeah. you know, because we've been denying I, i'm a strong believer in the heart energy and i believe that the heart is infinite and it holds everything and so it contains those beasts within us. And the beast is simply some aspect of ourselves that is not understood, that is not aligned with truth. And when we align it with truth, it becomes powerful. And so, you know, the thing that the majority of people um, have done is to sort of walk away from whatever has caused them this sort of pain or want to hide away from it. And I think that the greatest gift we can give ourselves and humanity is to begin to own it because that is what's going to change and shift the external world because it is only when we bring that genuine kind of integration in our heart that we're going to see a world that is integrated. Yeah. Again, listener, jump in and, and be a part of this. I want you to not only listen to the words Hema is saying, but I want you to listen to the resonance of her voice and where her voice comes from. And as she speaks about the work that she does with her heart, can you feel her voice even coming from her heart? Can you feel that, that every word is, is laden with heart energy and love energy and the way she speaks, the cadence of how she speaks? Can you feel that every word she says is, is um, confirmed by the vibration of the words she's saying. All too often, people speak the message but don't have the message. 
Can you feel even in the dark night of her soul, how her message still blazes on because of what, how much she feels what she's saying? Part of what I think has happened, and tell me what you think, it's a question, not who cares what I think. Um, I think we've forgotten how to feel. Yes. I think we think we know how we feel. Yeah. But, but thinking we know how we feel is in feeling. That's thinking. And I think because we're so ashamed of our booster, so scared of what we'll feel if we actually feel, and this passion that goes through the, the, the waves, like how is it possible that I don't know you and I feel you so much right now? Right? How is that possible? And, and one of the things that's happening in these conversations that I'm having is people are feeling me without me even knowing they're feeling me. Yeah. And they're experiencing me without me even knowing that they're experiencing me. And it's opening up things in them. And people are writing me saying they're having orgasms from the experience of feeling their centers open. Yeah. But it's not a sexual energy that I'm putting out, but the creative, the second chakra is a, is a creative energy. And because we don't know how to use creativity, we think sexuality and we experience that. And it threw me for a loop for a little while because I certainly didn't want anybody to um, feel guilty about what they're doing or bad about what they're doing. And, and I'm, I'm welcome to have them feel whatever they feel. Mm -hmm. But this is a broken down body. This is an old man. There's no reason that someone would want to have, that people would have a sexual experience with this body, this man but it's an energy that they feel that just makes them feel alive. It's, their, it's somehow in some ways touching their beast. Do you have thoughts on that? I do. Um, you know, it, it, it again comes back to the hard energy. I mean, from the minute sort of I got your message, you know, Daniel, I, mean, I just, I felt incredible bliss and I felt this incredible love you know, so I really agree with you. You feel people, you know, you feel their soul. If you let yourself genuinely feel, if you switch off the filters of the mind, filters of stereotype, filters of conditioning, then I think we see and feel people for who they really are. And, and everyone has such beauty in them and it's got nothing to do with the external you know because it is an energy and it is about how the two energies play together there's a beautiful resonance you know when two strangers meet and their hearts are in resonance i think that it creates you know this expansive space because you know we are greater than the sum of our parts yeah. so when your heart is open and my heart is open and the listeners hearts are open i feel we're creating this expansive space where there's a new possibility yeah. and that's what orgasm is you know if you think about what is orgasm it's you know two people merging together in this way of pure pleasure and bliss that allows an, a new possibility you know and so i think it's beautiful and and I feel it's important that people come back to this level of creativity. And it's important people come back to feeling what their feelings are and having the courage to work through the feelings that they don't particularly like or don't understand or that is caught up in the untruth so that they can experience this level of joy and bliss continuously because that's what we're here for. Yeah. And I love, for, first of all, I love you. You know, I just love who you are and what you say. Um, and I love that a person that I've never met, that we can sit together and we can talk about something so almost embarrassingly intimate, if we would let it be embarrassingly intimate. Yes. With no worries about being a weirdo or whatever's going on, like what... And just experience what that experience is and confirm and, and, and validate and hold that space. Because what you're doing for me is what, I'm, what I promised you I would do for you. Is you just accept loving and accepting me, acknowledging and validating me and, and listening to me and hearing me, hearing me. And so, again, for the listener, who knows where you are in this conversation, okay? 
But if, if these are odd statements for you, if these are, if these feel weird, if you feel, if you feel uh, scared of these statements or enraged by these statements or anything that you feel, I'm so happy because I want you to take a look at who's feeling what you're feeling and why you're feeling what you're feeling. Because so often we don't get challenged in that way to feel those feelings. We just put them aside and say, well, we can't talk about them. But look, when we bring them out into the light, how elevated they, they become. Emma, what is important to you? Love. What's really important to me is that we, we, you know, we get past this embarrassment and this idea that we can't talk about love, that it's fluffy, that it's, you know, it's not, not meant for the kind of corporate space or it's not meant for conversations between strangers or that it's only something that you see in these Hollywood movies or whatever it might be, or Bollywood movies, you know, depending on where you are in the world, whatever it might be. And it's not, it's so much more. It is a frequency, it is a vibration, and it is a vibration that is very, very much needed on this planet. When yeah. we think about everything that's going on, for me, it's really important that the energy of love begins to, you know, um, infiltrate people's hearts and we, we get over the awkwardness or the stereotyping of love and move into a space and place where we can all lovingly accept people and whoever they are, wherever they are, whatever they are, and, and bring that into shifts that need to happen on this planet because love is so important to me because I feel I'm here to bring about a real shift on this planet. What a beautiful, beautiful thing to be doing. So I was on a podcast recently, a few months ago, and the podcast host wasn't necessarily the sharpest tack in the garage, but he, he, he probably asked me one of the best questions, which went again at my idea of you can never look at somebody from a first impression and think what's going to happen. Yeah. Because my goal is to start a revolution of listening. My my goal is to also create a virus, but a virus that's a virus of love. That is an invisible virus that spreads contagiously, mass contagiously from one person to another. Yes. And so when I told him that my, my goal was to have a revolution of listening, he said, Danny, is there some way you weren't listened to as a child that this became so important to you? And I said, yeah, you know, my parents were great. We had, we had the ideal family, except they passed away too soon. And so I missed them and I wanted someone to, to listen to me like they listened to me. And I couldn't find that. My friends, once my parents passed away, my friends, as much as they commiserated with me and wanted to understand, they had no idea what it was like to be without parents. And so they couldn't understand the deepest emptiness of my heart. So I said, yes, I guess that's true. Mm -hmm. So is there something that happened in your life that made love so vitally important for you? Um, I get, I, I was so, so deeply loved and so deeply accepted, you know, because I was quite um, different from, like, from my culture. I was quite a rebel and quite an independent thinker. So were my parents. But definitely, I've been through lots of ups and downs in life, you know, circumstances that separated me from my parents during very key moments, you know, so when I was about three years old, my parents moved to the UK and I was left with my grandparents. And, you know, it's, it's recognizing that there is a level of love that you get from certain people that as much as somebody else might love you, there's a different quality to the love and the different, that different quality was a thing that made me search for that genuine feeling of love from within myself. Because what I realized is that no matter how much anybody loves you, including my parents, your parents, 
circumstances took them away from us at certain points in our lives or in your case you know took them away certainly on the physical realm and that's when you realize that actually there's a love that is from within and that is a deep love and that's the love we all need to get to because anytime we're looking for love externally it can and has the potential to disappear and that was something that was really you know important to me as a child and i also had an experience where i i you know saw a young child who i was then reunited with my parents so then i began to flourish and i realized how you know how reserved i became when my parents went around and how i flourished when they were in in my sort of orbit if you like even though they never really left me yeah. um, and then i saw other children in india where i was left um, who didn't have parents and would never have parents because the parents were taken away at a very young age or one parent was taken away or whatever the circumstances might have been and you realize we are all given different circumstances but love that is at the core of our hearts is, is pretty much always there love that. for anybody who suffered loss and i hear my sponsor smiling now and i don't mean this in any way as a sales um, the mosaic's all about loss. Yes. And it's about finding what it is you think you lost, but you never did. And, and so I really, really, if this, if this conversation resonates or if you feel lost at all, I really invite you to pick up a copy of the mosaic and read it because, um, but do more than read it. I often say to people, that the words will tell you a beautiful story and the words will touch your soul. But the space between the words will transform you. I love that. And I'm st only starting to understand what the space between those words are. That space between the wor those words is, is why Hema and I can connect before we even see each other. Because there's, we're not bound by the forms of the words or the bodies or the countries or the, or the belief systems. Mm -hmm. That there's a space that if we enter into that, that space is just vibrant and alive. And we draw to ourselves energies that start similar energies. What makes you happy? Um, balance, a real sense of, you know, flow, when life is in flow, when I'm giving and I'm being of service and I'm receiving, I'm receiving, you know, the, the incredible joy and the light of touching somebody's heart, whether it's through a smile, whether it's through a beautiful word or a, a sentence or, or a meaningful gesture or the work that I do. You know, because my work is my passion and my purpose. And so therefore, that makes me really happy when I'm actually being of service in the world and it's being received and, and I'm receiving the joy that it, it begets people. So we've danced around the work that you do without anybody, without us talking about it. It's probably time to bring in what it is you do. And I appreciate you not wanting to make this a work related, you know, sales conference thing, but um, it's so much a part of what you do that I think it's important for people to know what you do and how you do it and sort of what that looks like. Yeah. So, um, you know, sort of my technical kind of, um, name is I'm a psychologist and a mentor and a keynote speaker but you know what I really do is I'm, I'm really here to educate people about the power of the heart and the need to go into the heart space and need to clear out the sort of spaces and places where we are hiding pain hiding shame um, guilt and all of these negative things and really bringing to life the energy of the heart as a powerful force in the universe to bring about the changes that are so 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 needed um, and one of the things that i'm really working on in the corporate field is bringing the concept of omnipreneurship to the corporate space which is really about you know um, business businesses that are interested in 
not only the bottom line, but are interested in the people, are interested in their own self-development and interested in the planet. Every living organism has a space and place that is necessary and we need to start treating human beings as human beings and we need to start treating living animals, plants, uh, organisms as if they are important because at the end of the day they are mm -hmm. and we are not going to survive as humans if we kill off the very planet that houses all of the resources that we need. The love that we need is not just about other human beings, it comes from nature, it comes from every aspect of this planet and so I think it's time that businesses started really really bringing that to awareness and that's something I'm really passionate about. I love that. I had someone in this room who said something really insightful I thought and he said to me, our planet will survive us no matter what we do. Yes. It's nature is to survive. Yes. But we won't survive being on our planet if we continue to do what we do. Absolutely. So people sometimes I think, he said, people I sometimes think have it wrong that we have to save our planet. Our planet will do fine when we're gone. We have to save our existence on this planet because we won't do so fine when we're gone. That's right. And I thought that was so insightful because look what's happened with the virus, coronavirus. After two weeks of, no, of, of people being quarantined, the Himalayas were visible from 200 meters away, kilometers away. The Ganges was half as polluted, polluted as it ever was, and people never thought that would happen. They were, they were seeing animals return and fish returning to the, to the waters of Venice that hadn't been there for hundreds of years. Yes. Pollution was down in cities and, and no longer were companies dumping waste into rivers and oceans. And in two weeks time, the world had changed itself. It had, it had started to heal itself. Yes. So we don't have to be the saviors of the world. The world is trying to save us yes. and trying to get us to live in cooperation with us. So, I'm sensing you feel like things speak to us and have a message to us and talk to us if we would listen. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think hearts speak to each other and that's why we're able to know each other without knowing each other. And that, you know, and I think that all of nature has a heartbeat. It might not have a physical heart in the way that we do, um, animals and, you know, certainly do. But I mean, I believe absolutely every living organism is, is here to communicate with us without words. And it's so beautiful if we stop to listen. I love that. I think the first time I realized that things, I mean, I always understood it, but the first time it went from an understanding to an actual feeling and knowing it was when I was writing the mosaic. And mm -hmm. I thought it would take me about a month and a half to write because it's basically the story of my life fabulized and exaggerated a little in certain places, but not much exaggeration. And two and a half years later, I was lamenting because everything I was writing was being taken from me. It was being, I thought I saved it the night before and it wasn't there when I looked. Files got corrupted that I had worked on, on for months and I couldn't find them. Uh, it, my computer crashed and, and only the, the, the mosaic was not able to be restored. So I, I thought, what the heck is going on? Like, what are you trying to say to me? Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm going to invite these characters to a Zoom call. And they weren't real. I couldn't do it like you and I are doing. But I just said, I'm just going to have you come as if you're in a Zoom room. Now, Hema, you could be my imagination too. It's very possible you are. But you see, it seems pretty real. Yeah. <laughs> they seemed as real as this conversation. Wow. And I spoke with them. And one by one, I said to them, what's going on? Why won't you let this book be written? And each one of them in a different way said, you're not saying what we told you we want to say. You're saying what you're telling us you want us to say, but we don't want to say that. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. I'm, I've created you. Mm -hmm. 
I, I have the right, I think, to say what I think you want to say, don't, that I, what I want you to say. Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, you don't. Because once you created us, we have a reality. And we have to, you have to listen to the reality that we have and express what it is we want to say. Mm -hmm. And you're not doing that. And so we have to take your files away and corrupt them and lose them and not save them and do all that stuff. Because we don't want to be represented the way you're representing us. I couldn't believe it. Beautiful. They said to me, if you would listen to us, your book would be done in 30 days. Wow. And I said, you got a deal. I mean, if for no other reason, I want to be done with this damn thing. I want it, I, I want it done. Mm -hmm. When I read the mosaic, I just read it in a studio to put it as an audio, audio book. Mm -hmm. I started crying in places because I couldn't, like, I didn't know who wrote that. I didn't know, I, I didn't read, I, I never would have said that. I was sort of a, a little bit of a snob when I wrote it and they didn't want a snob writing it. And this, these words were the words of someone who heartfelt and sensitive and open and simple. And I realized why they wouldn't let it come out that way because they wanted me, if nothing else, to change me. And and they were writing the book for me to change. And so when I realized that characters that I made up had a reality that could speak, then I said, well, gosh, the world that we've made up would have that same ability, wouldn't it? Absolutely. So Emma, what do you think the world's trying to say to us right now? I think it's saying that we absolutely, absolutely, but that's, can I just say that's so beautiful. Yeah. I really love that. And the ability to be able to really, really listen, that's listening with your heart, you know, just really listening to the truth of the situation. And I think every living organism has a truth to share with us if we learn to listen. We've got to let go of our arrogance as human beings, thinking we're, you know, superior because yes, there's a bit of a hierarchy if you think about, you know, sort of being a white man, you know, um, and, you know, me being a woman of sort of Asian skin and Asian color and, you know, but, but we, as human beings, we think we're, we're greater and, and that has to shift. And I think nature's saying to us exactly that, that, you know, we're here to, to, to you know, support you you know, you're not here supporting us. You know, everything in nature is here to support us. Yeah. And, and I think that really it's saying time to rethink, time to rethink how we've been living, certainly for the last, you know, several hundred years and really decide who we want to be, how we want to be, if we want to get in touch with our own humanity, our own hearts, get in touch with nature, get in touch with other people, no matter what their culture, no matter what their beliefs, no matter who they are, where they come from, what their stories are. At the end of the day, we're all the same because we are all here to evolve. We're all here to have an experience and the quality of that experience is dependent on the, the quality of the input from us. Yes. And I think we need to put love into everything we do. I, I love that. I, I so support you in the work you're doing and that statement you're making, because I think it's one that really, really needs to be heard. I know for myself, I, I need to hear it, and I'm, I'm happy to hear it again and the reminder of it. Um, one of the beautiful places for me that the mosaic brought to me and it's in its revolution of my own soul was to not only use the story which is mo talking to the most ordinary people the most common people the the lowest of the low the trash man the blind woman the homeless guy not necessarily the saints and sages and to see the value in all that. Well, then I thought about the image of the mosaic, which I don't talk about in the book, but the, the word mosaic, it elicits the image of a mosaic. Yes. And when you see an image of a mosaic, really what you see is you don't see any verticality in that relationship. You don't see 
one piece teaching another piece. You don't see one piece t- telling another piece what to do or leading another piece or guiding another piece. You see pieces just coming together. Yes. And in the very nature of coming together, they make each other more beautiful. That's right. And I wondered if the new model, the new paradigm, Mm -hmm. is moving us away from this hierarchical white man, human being, planet uh, vision of the world where the self-help people help the people that need self-help and the leaders lead the people who need to be led and the business people lead the people who learn how need to know how to make money and all of that rather than what would just happen if we forgot all of that existed, that there was no height advantage, there was no verticality, but we lived in a horizontal world where it wasn't important what we taught each other as much as how we just loved each other and just came together and held each other. So. because in the beauty of the mosaic is you have all different colors, all different sizes, broken and whole, different textures, different shapes, different, different uh, materials. But in coming together, each one makes the mosaic more beautiful than it was before. And the mosaic makes each piece more beautiful than it was before. If it can be so simply put together in the image of a mosaic, Why do you think it's so hard for us to understand in the image of human interaction? I think a lot of what's happened with human beings is that we've become more and more obsessed with the idea of control. And I think any time you try and control anything, you're creating a vertical hierarchy. And so I love the idea of the horizontal, you know, where, you know, it's just about how we all move together and how we all fit together and absolutely you know, coming together makes it all the more beautiful. And we're just here to, to really, you know, encourage each moving part to move in the direction that it's meant to move in, be it a person or be it, you know, some other living organism. And so I think we struggle with it ever since there's been competition, ever since there's been a sense of, um, you know, needing to have more control and less control, then obviously competition drives a sense of separation and it drives a sense of needing to overtake others rather than working collaboratively. And and that's, you know, not just with people, but with, with the elements, you know, and I think that's what has taken us down that path. And now I think it's time to come back to the other path where we we do co-create and we do collaborate and we we work in cooperation and harmony. So with all that in mind, if you were to have two minutes right now to talk to a room of people and a world that's listening, what would you choose to say to this world? I would say that it is time for a heart renaissance. You know, it is time for the energy of the heart, the qualities of heart, which is more than love. It is the quality of trust. It is the qualities of transparency, communication, understanding, compassion, empathy. I mean, there's so many beautiful qualities of the heart and it is time for us to learn the power of the heart and to come back to a renaissance of the heart. I love that. You and my wife absolutely have to sit together. Her, her, her sort of logo or, or saying is trust in the power of your heart. Oh, beautiful. Which is like, it couldn't be more in resonance. Like you and I are in resonance, but you guys are like, I feel like you're, you're the same, you know, piece. You're not even different. Um, you're going to send me your headshot and all of your, your, your URL and all of your social media. But if people like everybody has a favorite place that they go to and they check it more often, how, how if people um, have fallen in love with you, which I'm sure they have, how would they reach out to you? What's the most surefire way of reaching out to you? What would be the one place they would go? Um, so I have a, a website, which is hemavias.com um, and LinkedIn. They're the sort of two spaces that okay. you know, really love. Yeah. Love that. So you'll see those both in the show notes. And um, what could be better 
in this world that we live in, for two people who don't know each other to come together and have a conversation that allows other people that don't know either one of us mm -hmm. to decide they want to get in touch with the, the, each other yes. and to have a conversation and to ask for help and guidance and just love coming together with those people and creating this mosaic of love that spreads mm -hmm. throughout the world. Yeah. Um, I only know Hema a very short time. But you don't have to know somebody a long time. I knew her before I even knew her. Yeah. And I would like to invite everybody who's listening, please go to her website, contact her through LinkedIn, and just open up a dialogue. Who knows where the dialogue would go? We had no idea when we opened up a dialogue through LinkedIn that we would be having this conversation a few days later. Absolutely not. Right. And, and yet here we are. And so if we, if we start to worry less about the how and just concentrate on what we feel. So I'm going to ask you, if you feel something through this conversation, trust that feeling. Reach out to him. If you're open, reach out to him. A beautiful thing happens in this room, and I used to think the room was magic, but there's no magic in this room. The room's an empty room until people walk into the room. That's right. The magic comes in the ability to come with an, a, a genderless conversation. Yes. To just listen without trying to drive a person into a point of view. Yes. To just really care enough about them to hear what they want to say. I've been with the richest people in the world. I've been with the most inspired people in the world. I've been with the people that inspire millions of people. And I've been with the poorest of the poor. Every single one of them wants these same three things. They want to be loved and accepted. They want to be listened to and heard. They want to be acknowledged and validated. And really when they, you give somebody that, you, they become seen in your eyes. They go from being invisible to seen. Yeah. I want to invite you all, listeners who are listening, to reach out to somebody you don't know and give them the opportunity to be seen through your eyes. You don't need to help them. You don't need to change them. You don't need to elevate them. You don't need to fix them. You don't need to do anything. And if you want to know how it all starts, it starts with a simple question. How are you? And all you have to do is listen to that response. Emma, before we go, is there one last thing you want to share or say before we close up? Um, I just want to say what an honor it's been to have this conversation. You know, the magic is in you and, you know, it's, it is your ability to authentically listen. You asked me the question, how am I? And I answered in a very general way. And then you asked me the question, how am I? And there was a difference yeah. and it was that difference that led to this beautiful conversation. So thank you so much for being you in the world, doing what you do. And I'm just really honored to have been a part of this conversation. Thank you so much. Uh, the honor is all mine and it will not be our last. It'll be our first guaranteed. I, I know. So, so I'm delighted about that. Thank you so much. Daniel. Thank you. Okay, thank you again, Hema. And for those of you who are listening, thank you again for listening. If you like this show, please share it with people you like. That's what happens. What's what we do as human beings. When we like something, we tell the people we like about it. So please share what you like with the people you like. And we'll start this revolution of listening. We'll start this virus of love that hopefully will become more contagious than anything that's ever existed. And without even knowing it, people who don't even know they have it will infect other people who don't even know they have it. And we'll start loving each other again in the ways that we never knew possible. Until the next stranger comes into this room, be kind to each other, love each other. And as Hema says, just feel the love that's around you. It's so intricately a part of everything you do.
and instill love into everything you do. Why not? What do you have to lose? Think of what you have to gain. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Ciao.